Your back. Thank you, sir. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the seminar series, Fall 2020, organized by the ULAB Department of English and Humanities. Our today's seminar is titled as the Invention of Creative Writing. I'm Rubaiyat, your host this evening. Uh, just to let you know that uh, we are also hosting this event live from our official ULAP uh, Facebook page. So feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. May I now please invite Professor Kaiser Hock, ULAP Dean, School of Arts and Humanities, to deliver his welcome address. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much. It is not an address at all. It's just an informal word of welcome to Shrikot Mojumdar. Um, Unfortunately, it's a virtual visit only, but I hope a real visit will follow once things settle down. Absolutely. But the welcome that we extend to him is warm and real, not virtual. So um, it, and it gives me special pleasure to um, say uh, hello and to welcome Shrikot because um, he is both a professor of literature and a creative writer with an impressive uh, list to his name. And we at, at the U Lab, we have just started recently uh, a, a small um, creative writing program, which is integrated into uh, a, a, an MA in English. And this is the first time that uh, such a program has been introduced in the Bangladesh University. So um, I'm sure our creative writing students and the interest generated is uh, by, by the program is uh, quite encouraging. I think uh, it's quite remarkable that um, somehow um, the, this, this new, this invention that Shoikot is going to talk about has become a very popular one or it's gaining popularity very rapidly. Um, I think that there must be about a dozen Bangladeshis who have um, gone through creative writing programs, mainly in North America, um, one at least in the UK. And uh, the, the interest generated by our program is also a sign, I think, of the way things are moving. Um, so this, this topic will be of particular interest to uh, our creative writing students and also to all our colleagues and students who will be able to get a uh, practicing critic writer's view of this interesting uh, invention. Um, I will not take, take, take any more time and I'll slowly fade away. Because unfortunately, I've been advised complete rest being COVID post positive. So, um, but it's really a, a pleasure and an honor to be able to say hello and welcome uh, to Shrikot. And I hope you um, enjoyed talking to our virtual audience who, who I'm sure will also have, uh, have lots of interesting questions to ask you. Um, I will, later on, of course, I will see the whole thing um, when, when I get the recording. But I, I, I hope this program is a great success. In fact, I'm sure it will be a great success and will go down very well with, uh, our, our, with the audience. So thank you, Shrikot, for um, making, taking the trouble of coming here. The, the biggest advantage of a virtual visit is that uh, you don't need a visa. And you don't have to go through immigration. So um, I hope you enjoyed the, this uh, exchange um, with with our uh, students and uh, uh, fellow faculty members. Thank you very much. And Rubaya, thank you for um, hosting this show um, with characteristic charm. Okay. Um, uh, th thank you very much. And I'll just quietly take take my leave. I'm very Thank moved very much. to hear that you are still here amid this COVID positive and the best wishes for a speedy recovery. Yeah. No complications, so I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Take care of yourself.
May I now please request the Pro Vice Chancellor of ULAB, who is also the head of the Department of English and Humanities, Professor Dr. Shamshad Mortuza, to share his remarks and introduce our distinguished speaker of the seminar, and also to officially invite to begin his presentation. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Rubai, and uh, thank you, Kaiser Sir Lekina. So, uh, despite your illness, uh, you have shown your commitment to the department and as well as uh, the spirit of the program that we are doing here. So, thank you for that. Uh, this is quite interesting because uh, Shoikat and I, we have a mutual friend, uh, Dr. Ulka Anjaria, uh, who is at Brandeis, and she came here for our language, literature, and community conference in 2018. And we were talking about the future of English studies. And she highly recommended that we invite Shoikat Mojumdar, you know, to talk about these issues because uh, this is one area that, you know, so uh, interests him quite widely. And quite by chance, like, you know, I was going through my old emails and I came across uh, this name and I dropped in a line and lo, like, you know, within 10 minutes, there was a warm response. And this is typical of, uh, I guess, uh, the Bangladesh component in Shoikot. So we got to talking, we got into this idea that uh, Shoikot's ancestral home is from Jashur, and so is my Nana Bari. So we have that connection. And uh, I don't know whether that silver fish that Shoikot writes about has to do with the Hilsha or not, but, uh, uh, so thank you so much. Thank you for agreeing uh, to speak on this occasion. As Kaisuser was saying that, you know, we are the first one to have a kind of a, uh, you know, strain in creative writing. And we want this to like, you know, grow into a full-fledged program, you know, and we, we have ambitious plan with it. So we are really looking forward for international collaboration. And Ashoka being one of the probably the only liberal arts uh, school in India and ULA being the only liberal arts in Bangladesh. So it's quite natural that, you know, we connect and it's about time we connect. So I've been in correspondence with Dr. Vanita Shastri and trying to see like, you know, whether uh, there would be any future collaboration or not. But at this point, like, you know, so I'm really grateful that, you know, you could make time for us. So I'll, for, for the audience, I'll just share the bio that uh, Shoikot Mojinber has on his uh, own personal blog. So Shoikot Mojinber is a list, academic and a popular commentator on arts, literature, and higher education. He's the author of three novels, including most recently, The Scent of God, which came out last year, 2019. Then the widely acclaimed The Firebird, 2015 and Silverfish, uh, the debut novel, which came out in 2007. He has also published a book of literary criticism, Prose of the World, uh, which came out in 2013, and a journal on higher education, college pathways of possibilities. This is the book actually Ulka and I started talking about. And uh, he has also co-edited a collection of essays called The Critique as Amateur. Um, it's a very interesting concept that he has, and I was, uh, uh, listening to his YouTube, uh, you know, sound bites, uh, and uh, he has a lot to so say about the amateurish role of a critic. Now, Shoikot, as you probably know uh, from our Evite, that he has taught at Stanford University, and he was named a fellow at the Humanities Center at Wellesley College, and is currently professor of English and Creative Writing at Ashoka University. He writes regularly on higher education, arts, and literature for Times Higher Education, Hindu, Outlook, and also writes a bi-weekly column on college campus and academic life called Cheat Sheet, uh, and, and also on outlookindia.com. So uh, please feel free to go to his website, shoikatmojimdar.com, and uh, I'm sure you will get plenty of ideas you know, how to engage not only you know, literary landscape, 
but also uh, how to present your ideas. Amazing. So I was really impressed uh, by your website and the way he had, you know, managed his own work. So th that's something rare. Like, you know, when you think of a creative artist, sometimes you think that, you know, so they're not that uh, composed and well organized. But uh, uh, here is a website, you know, that will definitely uh, draw you in. So uh, that's about it. So thank you, Dr. Shoikat Majumdar. And the idea of, you know, so creative writing is, you know, new relatively in, in our part of the world, but I, I am sure that you have a different take on it. So it's going to be challenging and exciting. So over to Dr. Shoikat Majumdar. Thank you so much, once again. Thank you so much, Shamshad, uh, Professor Hawk, and all of you, uh, it's a great, uh, Delight to be here. I wish it could be a real visit, but I'm, I'm hoping that'll happen. I've heard such wonderful things about the University of Liberal Arts, um, as well as the Dhaka Lit Fest, and that I'm, it's almost hard for me to believe that I haven't been there. As Shamshad points out, uh, like many Bengali Indians, my roots go back to Bangladesh. So um, it's, it's a double happiness. And in fact, as I was listening to you speaking, I realized what a great relief it is to sort of hear my name pronounced right. <laughs> you know, one speaks in many different parts of the world, even different parts of India. And that is a that is a pleasure that doesn't often come. But it's so nice to feel that I'm already feeling at home. Uh, um, I was about to say that, you know, you showed up because of your shortcut name, you know. So you showed up like you know, the, the pun we, can, we could have used. Um, I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, did he say something about name? Yeah. No, I was saying that, like, you know, you kind of showed up, you know, so because of the Shoikot, because, yeah. Oh, right, 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 <laughs> true. Shoikot, it's very easy for in North India to be called Saikat, you know, or much less anywhere else. But uh, speaking of language and pronunciation, I, I think I have a um, fairly provocative title for today's talk, The Invention of Creative Writing. And as, um, you know, all of you here probably know that language is not merely a passive reflection of reality. Language also creates reality. And I think anyone who has followed political speeches knows that really well. Um, so all these you know, different kinds of writing that we are used to thinking of as creative, whether it's poetry, fiction, drama, essays, screenplay. Um, now, much of this obviously existed you know, for a long time. But um, what my interest is in this talk to talk about when did we start to think of them as creative? What is the what does the word mean? Where did the word come from? You know, and of course the related question whether it can be taught. You know, is it what is the history of this discipline? You know, at universities and beyond, and it's not really so much about how to write, though I think a few things will come up as I talk. Uh, so I want to begin with um, a text. Um, some of you might know of this uh, by James Kudzia, the South African writer James Kudzia. He had this really interesting, I don't even know what to call it, a short story or an essay. It's this book uh, collected uh, called Elizabeth Costello, which um, I hope some of you have read. Um, it's this um, sort of collection of stories, but much of the stories are taken up by long lectures. So they are kind of, they sort of evoke the old European model of the novel of ideas. So they're fictional, but much of it is argumentation and discussion. And I'm specifically interested in one text there called the novel in Africa. And um, the lead character of this book is this um, novelist, Elizabeth Costello. She's a um, Australian novelist in her late sixties, a very established novelist. Some people say that she's a kind of a projection of Kudzia who obviously moved to Australia. Uh, that's a different debate, uh, but she is in this particular story or essay, uh, she's uh, traveling in a cruise ship a kind of a cruise ship for luxury cruise ship for very wealthy European um, passengers. Um, and she's been invited there by an old friend called Emmanuel Egudu, who is a Nigerian novelist, or rather he used to be a novelist. He hasn't written a novel in a long time. They're both roughly in the same age group, but he makes a living from performing in these cruise ships. And uh, much of this text is occupied by two lectures. But what the point of interest is during his lecture, Iman um, Egudu, the Nigerian novelist, uh, makes this very interesting claim. He says that you see the novel is an alien form in Africa. 
right? It, um, the novel is a written form. It is a certain kind of, um, it has to do with print. People have to sit and read novels on their own. Uh, it's a very isolated activity. In Africa, we don't have any time for that. In Africa, we are a communal culture. We are an oral culture. We believe in oral storytelling. We, we, this, is, this is not for us. You know, the novel doesn't have a place in Africa. And, you know, I'm, the, and, and I think if you read the text, you'll know that this, um, this claim is sort of made with a lot of skepticism. There's a sense that Elizabeth Costello is very skeptical of this. Oh, he's selling a certain kind of masculine blackness. He's selling a certain kind of Africanness. It's very exotic. So I, I'm not suspicious, I'm suspicious of all that. And they also have a personal relationship, a personal history. But that is a whole other issue. What I wanted to point it is, an, uh, even if we don't take Egudu's claim very seriously, there's something important in what he says is that, um, you know, the novel as a form has a certain origin in Western modernity. You know, you forget about, um, you know, going outside the uh, going outside the West. Even if you go to the West, this um, there's this notion that I'm creating something that I'm a creative person, you know, that it involves a certain notion of self-consciousness, a certain kind of interiority, you know, which actually, as again, many of you, especially scholars of the 18th century would know very well, did not exist even in the West. I'm not even going outside the non-West now, but even in the West, it didn't exist before a certain point of time. Uh, like somebody like Shakespeare um, or Homer or Milton, none of these so-called writers, even if you can call them writers, that's debatable, did not think of themselves as creative. They did not think of themselves as original storytellers in any way. I mean, Shakespeare, obviously, probably with the possible exception of The Tempest, uh, all his uh, sort of plays were ideas taken from either Hollinshed's Chronicles, um, English Chronicles or Plutarch's Lives, or myth or story or English history or somewhere. I mean, Homer obviously took from, you know, kind of Greek history, Milton plagiarized from the Bible. Clearly none of them were invested in the idea of the original story. That was not even important. Um, they were rather invested in sort of taking from this great communal mind, which obviously stores myths, legends. The writer as an individual, much less a private individual did not come into being. You know, but more importantly, it's not just about where stories come from. It's also about, um, you know, also about um, Shakespeare would be very surprised um, with the um, with the idea of, um, you know, with the idea of um, the creative, uh, the artist, you know, a, a term which is applied so much to Shakespeare, you know, that, oh, he's a genius. And we now know that that's a term that is anachronistically applied to Shakespeare, notably by the German romantics who kind of invented the term in the 18th century and sort of applied retroactively. So Shakespeare would not understand. I mean, my Ashoka colleague, Jonathan Gil Harris puts it very well. Shakespeare probably thought of himself as the Elizabethan equivalent of the Bollywood producer, Bollywood playwright. He was much more interested in commerce. He was interested in, you know, um, you know making a profit. And most importantly, he was in, in, interested in the performative, the idea of literature as something written exactly what Igudu is saying, that it's an oral thing. You know, the idea that, um, you know, that, um, that something um, is, um, that idea of performative, Shakespeare did not really, um, was not really interested in that. Now, um, obviously this happens, you know, this significantly happens with the enlightenment as again, some of you might know that the European enlightenment is the kind of the defining time when the idea of the private individual, you know, becomes very important. And in many ways, the idea of the artist owning a story, the artist owning an idea also starts to gather momentum around this time. And, um, and I think in many ways it reflects the capitalist idea of private ownership of property, private ownership of, you know, um, you know um, ideas or, or, or a story. But um, following the enlightenment, I mean, enlightenment is of course the great moment of modernity in Europe. I mean, so not only a certain kind of scientific uh, thinking, a certain kind of secular way of life, you know, uh, technology, the industrial revolution, even the nation state, thanks to the French revolution. As, as you know, this was a kind of a moment of modernity, which obviously also gets globalized. 
you know, worldwide thanks to colonialism, you know, and colonialism creates that globalization. But, um, but um, following that, this romanticism is the first movement which creates the idea of the solitary artist, that the artist sitting in a kind of a private space and creating ideas out of nowhere. I mean, you see this directly if you compare the poetry of, say, Alexander Pope and Dryden with, say, poetry of Wordsworth and Coleridge. Suddenly, from a very social, gossipy space, you move into a completely lonely, private, solipsistic space. So the idea of that romantic artist, one who sits and creates things out of nowhere, you know, suddenly it's no longer the communal mind. Suddenly it's a very private self. So this really comes into being around this time, around romanticism. And what's most interesting is, you know, if you take, um, say, plays or poems, they existed, they, exi they, they predated this moment. They were plays were performed, now they're printed, you know, poetry was performed or heard, now they're printed. Print obviously is the biggest division that people can sit and read. But the one art form which is actually created by this moment is the novel, because the novel is impossible. You can't have a 400 page and early English novels were quite long, you know, narrative in form of oral storytelling. So it was definitely, um, very much um, an act of print. So this this kind of readership Egudu is talking about in the novel in Africa, or sit and read alone, or sit and write alone. You know this whole kind of communication, as opposed to being in a stage or in a in a bar on a kind of a um, um, a, a tragedy or a minstrel singing songs. You know, like a bowl. You know, so from there we suddenly print makes it possible, and it's not just print; it's also capitalism. It's capitalism and the rise of the middle class, as, as you probably know, Shakespeare's Globe Theater had, um, you know, the aristocrats, the royalty, and it had the groundlings. There was literally no middle class. And suddenly um, a middle class is possible and uh, they have enough leisure and enough time and enough literacy to sit and read. And so the birth of the reading class obviously goes back to this. And all of these conditions, the technological condition of printing, the economic condition of the rise of the bourgeoisie, you know, makes the novel possible. And in many ways, you know, sort of literature as we understand it, you know, comes into being. Literature as a kind of written form to be consumed in private through reading, you know, it kind of comes into it. And what's also interesting is our idea of the creative is very much sort of rooted in this, you know, obviously, you know, obviously today we think of, you know, clearly think of playwrights and musicians, everything is creative, but in some ways, you know, this idea of the creative, because in the pre-modern art, I think it's possible to say art really existed for its own sake. You know, the, I mean, if you think of when a mother is singing a lullaby to a child, she doesn't care how beautiful the song is because she is trying to get something done. She's trying to put a child to sleep, you know. So much of pre-modern art, whether it's the painting or sculpture inside a church or, or a religious place or music, it was often tied to a certain function. It's only in the post-enlightenment world that art comes to occupy its own space with the idea of the artistic. In fact, you know, I think a pre-modern person would be very surprised if they walked into a room but there was nothing but paintings hung on the wall. Like, what is this? They would probably ask, oh, where's the shrine? Where's the crucifix? Why are the, what is paintings doing there? That a paintings can exist in a sort of secular space and can be its own end would not make much sense. It was very functional. And I think the, you know, the vestiges of the functional thinking obviously lives on in the non-Western world, in our parts of the world, you know, but even in the West, in the pre-enlightenment, so this, this consciousness wasn't there. So that's what I'm trying to get to, the idea of the creative. And um, and I, I always think that, you know, it's very interesting that um, literature, um, I, I, I always say that literature is the most artificial of all art forms. And the reason I say is that I don't I don't mean artificial in a negative sense. I mean artificial, purely in a neutral sense. That um, that um, obviously music, or um, you know painting, they have a sensory component. You can listen to music. You can 
what you can see painting. But literature is the only art form which literally depends on an artificial signifier, a signifier which doesn't have a sensory component, but which exists purely because of sort of a social agreement. I mean, some of you might know of Roman Jakobson's and Saussure's um, sort of arguments about the arbitrary nature of the language that obviously a cat doesn't mean cat, it can mean dog and dog, God can mean dog. So there's completely artificial. So literature is also the only art form which needs to be translated. You can still watch painting or listen to music without, but it has to be translated. And I feel within that, one can take this a step ahead and say that the novel is the most artificial and in therefore the most literary of all art forms. But the reason I say this is, you know, um, poetry obviously has a oral component. Rhythm is physical. Rhythm appeals to our ears. Uh, of course, that's not the only element it has, but it does have a physical element. You know, drama, of course, is performative, you know, when it's performed. But novel is the only art form which um, depends completely on this artificial process of signification. It is not, it doesn't. Of course, a novel can also have the logic of, you know, um, the logic of poetry sometimes, you know, obviously, you know, sometimes when we use a refrain, a repetition using the logic of poetry, a novel can obviously, when it's using dialogue, it is using the dramatic elements, but as, it, as itself, it's actually in some ways the most literary and therefore it's also the most rooted in modernity. It is the form which would not be possible without modernity. But I also tell my students in my creative writing classes that it's also, therefore, because it's implied, it is also, it has the highest possibilities. And the simple meaning, what I mean by that is a novelist, even a most realistic novelist, even a most realistic novelist can describe something, uh, no matter how carefully they are describing or they are wearing a, a blue shirt or they're, Okay, there's a bookcase behind them or whatever. I think every single person will take a different meaning of that. You know, even the word blue doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. Even a bookcase means different things to different people. It is always something different, right? And the simple example of that is that I don't think anybody has ever watched a film based on um, um, book they've read and come out and said that, oh, that was exactly how I thought. It never happens. You know, and no, people, people, you might say, oh my God, that was Darcy. I would have never thought Darcy would be like that. Oh, that was what um, Elizabeth looked like. I mean, you might like it more or you may dislike it, but it's never the same. Um, and this is obviously, you know, um, talking of very realistic writing. You know, if it's the writing is experimental, you know, forget about that. Even more complex words like grief, um, emotion, love, they have so many different meanings that Whenever, so whenever a writer is using this word, they are, they are kind of letting the reader sort of write it all over again, recreate it. I mean, compared to say a filmmaker who can show, of course, film moments are also open to interpretation and reinterpretation, but there's a literal degree of physical representation that the filmmaker can do. But with the novelist, that's not, not the case at all. Even the most realistic, realistic novelist, now, obviously, I think what's also interesting is the way how, you know, the novel um, sort of has to work very hard to be taken seriously as an art form. So the novel, as you probably know, you know, um, throughout the 19th century, it was very much like a television soap or a Netflix episode. You know, people used to literally wait in New York Harbor when the Dickens's um, installments were out in England, but not in America. They'd come and say, oh, is Little Nell dead? The kind of suspense, you know, this was long before obviously internet or any kind of electronic media. So the tension was, it was very popular. But of course, you know, the irony is that um, the popular, you know, always meant that it was not a serious art. You know, it was not really seriously artistic. It is entertainment. I think that is the same thing we've seen in you know, in Bangla literature of this time, Bonkim Chandra, the kind of disdainful way, the words Natak novel, you know, obviously Natak also had that term, Natak novel for eyes, not seen as, you know, kind of uh, that moral connection was also there. And this was the same in the West, that um, it was uh, entertainment. It didn't have the high prestige of poetry or drama. So tragedy was a form which belonged to drama. And this, um, really starts to happen through Henry James. 
the figure of Henry James, who uh, writes the famous essay, The Art of Fiction, and James, and subsequently the modernists, you know, like James Joyce, you know, um, you know, um, um, that uh, the idea that um, that um, that's something much more complex, that the novel can also be an art form, just the way poetry is, you know, or um, the kind of new critical attention someone like James Joyce takes, you know, Stephen Dedalus is a very autobiographical character in that sense, Stephen Dedalus is constantly thinking about craft, constantly thinking about, you know, how to um, sort of a self-conscious writer. So, um, and through that, the novel kind of establishes itself as an art form. And of course, the irony is that this, I think the novel's process of establishing itself as an art form is symptomatic of the larger process through which literature comes into being, that literature suddenly from being the pre-modern process of simply entertainment in a pub with scops and minstrels to a kind of Elizabethan day when somebody could go and entertain themselves by watching a hanging or watching a Shakespeare play. It's like a choice, which is why Shakespeare's plays are so much death on them because he was competing with execution. So this whole idea of, from there, literature is becoming a serious established entrenched art form in a discreet and specialized place. And I think the novel's fortune through the 19th and the 20th century really reflects that. It reflects that change, that it sort of, just as it becomes a high art form, it also ceases to be a popular form, which is kind of unfortunate. There are other reasons behind it, of course, most important being the rise of electronic communication, cinema, most importantly, and later television. But of course, it kind of loses that form. And I think in the history of, um, 20th century and 21st century writing, I, I think um, there are exceptions. I think um, if you take someone like um, J.D. Salinger, you know, for instance, um, Catcher in the Rye, he was trying to do something very experimental, but it's also highly popular. I think uh, in India, Arundhati Roy has got a small things as an example where very interesting linguistic experimentation has prevented it from um, being, being popular um, in, in Bangladesh. Um, I've been reading the works of uh, Mashur Arifin. I think Mashur Arifin is a, another really interesting example from contemporary Bangladesh who's very experimental writer, but there's something very human about his writing. And I believe it's, it's a very popular in Bangladesh from what I hear. So clearly that strain hasn't gone away. There have been in history writers who have sort of been able to combine the experimental with the popular. But on the whole, I think the novel moves on to this state of canonical art form and it sort of loses connection with the market. But what's most interesting is the modernists, the modernists are very key here. They create a literary self-consciousness. And in many ways, what Jürgen Habermas had suggested a uh, hundred years before that in the 18th century, that what he talked about was the creation of the public sphere. And the public sphere was very much a literary public sphere. The public sphere, as opposed to the state, public sphere, um, sort of made up of cafes and magazines and you know literary periodicals and coffee houses, the kind of zone where you can have this sort of chatter, the chattering class. Basically, he was kind of sort of predicting a certain media sphere, you know. And for for Habermas, it's a very com complex concept. But what he was trying to roughly say is that the that the public sphere is the space where we can be vigilant about the state. If the state becomes tyrannical then the public sphere is the space where we can be a corrective. And what's interesting is Habermas's public sphere is very much a literary public sphere. It's about coffee houses. It's about, you know, um, it's about writers. It's about art. It's about painting. It's all about that. And it's very interesting. It's about a hundred years later, the modernists kind of entrench that formation of the literary public sphere in a kind of a lifestyle. So if you look at um, Bloomsbury in London, if you look at Greenwich Village or Harlem in New York or the Left Bank in Paris, uh, you have this notion. I mean, this is the where a certain kind of lifestyle. Oh, if you're a writer, you must live this hard drinking life. You must have sex with as many people as possible. You must wear black. You must have this mournful look. You must, um, you must be a bohemian. You must live in this downtown life. And this is a very interesting, this, concept of the artistic lifestyle, this concept of the literary life was really created by 
by the modernists. And it had tremendous magnetic power because people came from different parts. So there's this whole sense that, oh, I live in this really remote place, this rural, uh, this village, and I must go to London or Paris or, um, or New York or even within cities. I mean, you know, I think people have moved from rural Bengal to Kolkata or Dhaka to kind of create this artistic life that I'm in a periphery. Of course, this is what brought someone like James Joyce from sort of provincial Dublin to Paris. This is what brought so many writers to Paris and London. So this is the very interesting thing that how the idea of the literary, how the idea of the artistic, how the idea of the creative, with every layer it gets entrenched, with every layer it slowly gets entrenched and all of these things we take for granted today, we kind of assume that's true, but they were really created by history. They were really created by certain historical processes, right? And, um, you know, this is, I think, also the moment, you know, this um, um, modernist, the early part of the 20th century, the Second World War. And from the Second World War onwards, I think the American element of the story becomes very important. This is where it becomes Americanized. And there's a, a very good book by um, Mark McGurl, uh, Stanford academic, uh, my previous colleague, um, who has this book called um, The Program Era, The Rise of Creative Writing. And McGurl has some very interesting claims to make. He says that, you know, that when creative writing actually enters the universities from this, so uh, you can see the trajectory, it becomes a conscious art form, it becomes a clearly, and then finally the last step is it actually enters the universities. And when it enters the universities, it's a very paradoxical thing because schools are seen as a very bureaucratic place where you do rote learning, where you do exams and suddenly, and yet the supposed goal of school is being creative, being imaginative, you know, kind of express your inner creativity. So creative writing kind of becomes an obvious place where the self-expression, you know, becomes um, realized. But at the same time, there's this kind of conflict between um, you know, can writers really be confined by this unglamorous bureaucratic institutional life? I mean, do you see them as marking papers? Do you see them as, um, you know, like uh, serving on committees, making curriculum? Are they really made for that kind of thing? And it's very interesting, the writer and the professor uh, were seen as kind of opposed units, but in America, in the post war, they kind of become one. And uh, I'm just going to share a quote here, which is very interesting, a couple of uh, from my girl's book, uh, because I have the advantage of screen sharing. I'll just share this with you and read to you briefly. Um, yeah, so if you look at this quote, for instance, um, um, as an elective element of the undergraduate curriculum, creative writing is used an invitation to student consumers to develop an intensely personal relationship to literary value, one that for the most part bypasses the accumulation of traditional cultural capital. That is a relatively rarefied knowledge of great authors and their works in favor of a more immediate identification with the charisma of authorship. Taking a vacation from the usual grind, the undergraduate writer becomes a kind of internal tourist, voyaging on a sea of personal memories and transient observations of her social environment, converting them via the detour of craft and imagination into stories. By contrast, to read and analyze a novel in a regular literature class is to turn around and head back towards the workplace, back that is toward the submissiveness of homework. So notice how um, it's also very interesting to remember that literature had become a subject also fairly recently. You know, obviously, and some of you might know the colonial history of that. You know, this was subcontinental India, where because obviously in 19th century Britain, early 19th century Britain, only the classics. Greek and Latin were considered prestigious enough to be studied in universities. You know, English is something, oh, who cares? I mean, it's something, I guess the status which Bangla might have in, you know, kind of Kolkata or Dhaka, that, oh, it's a vernacular. Do you really need to study it? You know, is it, I mean, it, a subject has to be sufficiently painful for you to be able to get a degree in it. If, you, if you're really getting pleasure out of it, if it's all around you, that how can you justify it become an academic subject? So English had that problem in Victorian England and of course Marxist scholars have pointed out how, how the rise of certain um, sort of so-called subaltern classes, notably the arrival of women, the working classes, and finally the colonial people 
that it, that English became a certain that, oh, these people are not smart enough to study the classics. That's for the aristocratic men. So let's give them an imitation subject, English. Yeah, that will do. And in the colony, of course, English becomes a kind of a great means of soft power. This sort of establishes the superiority of English civilization. So we all know that story. People like Gaurav Vishnathan have written about that. But it's very interesting that only in 1920s and 30s Cambridge, that F.R. Lewis and all are sort of making English an academic discipline. And it's only about 30 years later how creative writing. And I think in this matter, the sort of self-consciousness, sort of establishment of literature and writing as self-conscious practices are essential. If writing is something like, for instance, why is that writing graffiti on the roadside not an academic discipline? It has to sort of become canonized. It sort of moves from the margin to the center. And that was what was happening to writing over this last 200 years, to the point where it happened, it became central enough for it to enter university. And that is that is very interesting that how, um, you know, to the point, of course, where the term creative widens so much that it almost lost meaning. I mean, now I think the word creative is used more commonly in business schools, you know, you know, clearly, you know, theater and corporate practice are very important. Advertising obviously has kind of the word creative. I mean, even so, there's a certain um, kind of contradiction here because um, what's very interesting is the arts went through a very uneven trajectory of patronage. I mean, again, in the pre-modern age, you're talking of the world of Shakespeare and Renaissance painters. You know, there was no mass market. There was only patronage. So for instance, in the early days, manuscripts were handwritten and ex only extremely wealthy people or aristocrats or the monasteries and manuscripts. So um, clearly you could not make a living as a writer because there was no sale of books. Uh, so there was this patronage system. You did not need a large number of readers, but you needed one wealthy patron. Now, what the Enlightenment in modernity and print culture does is it actually transforms the need, um, the structure from the patronage to publishing. And publishing is where the one wealthy patron becomes sort of scattered and divided into multiple readers. Now, it's very fascinating that as the 20th century comes along, you know, forms like poetry and the literary novel, as they sort of slowly move away from the marketplace, they are again returning to a kind of a patronage system. You know, wealthy foundations, donors, they support the arts just the way they've always supported forms like classical music and, and significantly universities. Universities are the courts of the modern time that, you know, essentially, I mean, everybody knows I, I, I did an MFA in America and I taught there for several years. Clearly, uh, the almost the only way you can make a living as a poet or even certain kind of complex literary writer is by getting a university job. So clearly it's very interesting how, um, this is what people like McGill have charted that how creative writing um, industrializes, sorry, how the university actually industrializes creative writing and makes it a certain kind of a academic discipline. And it also creates a livelihood and a certain cottage industry around it. You know, even then, there's a really interesting quote by Alfred Krasin. I want to point out there's the contradiction. And in the mid 50s, Krasin is saying this, all of this represents a great change, wrote Alfred Krasin, the great critic in the mid 1950s, already amazed by the transformation he was witnessing. When I was in college in the 30s, it was still well understood that scholars were one class and writers quite another. They did not seem to belong to the same order of mind. They seemed quite antithetical in purpose and temperament. And at the very least, they needed different places to work in. So notice that, you know, incredulity is even there in the, in the, um, in the 1950s. But that's reality has already changed. But of course, you know, McGurl, I think in, in the book, he talks about that, you know, this changes a lot and the big exceptions, as we all know, are the poets and the new critics, because the new critics were all poet, people like John Crow Ransom, Alan Tate, Clint Brooks, Robert Penn Warren, Penn Warren was a novelist, you know, but most of them were poets. I mean, T.S. Eliot himself is an example. He almost finished his PhD, but very much a poet critic. Um, places like Vanderbilt University and Kenyon College, which set up Kenyan Review as you know, um, one of the flagship journals. 
So um, they, the culture of the poet critic, you know, the culture of the poet who's also a critic. I mean, this is something that would um, sort of fall apart later on in the later part of the 20th century, partly because of the rise of theory, rise of critical theory, rise of deconstruction, you know, the, the, the rise of cultural studies, all kinds of processes. But even at this point, it's perfectly possible on both sides of the Atlantic to be a poet critic. I think that division actually was never lost in Bangla. In Bangla, for instance, writers are very comfortably sort of being critics and poets at the same time, you know, that was never there. But in the Anglo-American world, this division is starting to set in. But this time it wasn't there. But even so, there are writers who are famous teachers. I mean, one great example comes from the novelist Jay McConnell's memoirs of being taught by Raymond Carver, who, as, as you probably know, is almost like the sort of the DT, the presiding DT of American creative writing programs. His minimalist style is very famous. And he talks about um, how Carver used to return the stories like full of notes, full of annotations, full of micro marks in every bit of manuscript. And there was a time when he said, you know, Carver and I sat together debating the word, um, or the debating the use of the word earth for like half an hour. You know, and Carver felt it, it should be grounded in, in a single story. So this kind of attention, of course, says a lot about who Raymond Carver is, because Raymond Carver's, you know, sort of really dumb, the kind of Hemingway tradition of very minimalist writing is sort of passes into Carver. And I mean, I, I taught at Stanford before I moved to Ashoka and Stanford, the, one of the creative writers was Tobias Wolf and Tobias Wolf was very much a Carver admirer. So this was actually, um, they were all in Syracuse. So Syracuse where George Sanders, George Saunders, Tobias Wolf, they were all writing. And from there that, that really travels around. And, um, and, but there's an opposite example that probably the most famous, you know, and hilarious opposite example would be of Vladimir Nabokov who taught at Cornell and he absolutely hated teaching. So he's like, you know, I can't bear to teach. I mean, he's just someone who's just teaching to make a living. And when Lolita came out and he made a lot of money from it, he was like, I don't want to do this anymore. So it's very interesting how this happens and how creative writing actually gets invented. First, the idea of creative writing you know, that one can be creative and one must be creative as a writer. Again, something which I, as I said, writers like Shakespeare don't understand. And then creative writing as a kind of a discipline. In the, in the United Kingdom, um, I think the university that has done the most work is uh, University of East Anglia, as opposed to the more traditional Oxford and Cambridge, because they were, like the Ivy Leagues, quite resistant to the idea of creative writing. And, um, you know, now, uh, now um, I'm, I'm based in India, and in India, actually, it's, very, it's been very interesting. There have been um, clearly several writers, like, um, you know, who also taught at universities, taught literature. I'm thinking of Firak Gorakhpuri, who wrote in Hindi and Urdu, or Harvan Shrai Bachchan, who uh, wrote in Hindi and Arvind Krishna Marotra who wrote in English and all three of them taught literature at the University of Allahabad. And um, in Kolkata, you know, we obviously had people like Shankar Ghosh and Navani Pradeepshin uh, who taught at the Comparative Literature Department in Jadapur. Um, or my own alma mater, um, St. Davis College, Professor P. Lal who taught there. And, um, and there's this long tradition of the writer teaching literature, you know, there's obviously even, um, um, they were also kind of writer critics and very much in the teaching life. Um, but there's this tradition and, but there's also this other tradition. I think, um, I'm my friend Vivek Shanbagh, the Kannada writer often tells me his, um, father-in-law, your Anantamurti was of the belief that a writer should have a day job, which has nothing to do with writing. They should be like working in an insurance company or a bank, as we know, <laughs> Mashu can tell us about that, that completely disconnected. So it's a very interesting kind of a um, idea. But of course, when creative writing enters the university, you get to kind of rationalize that presence. Even a beginning writer can say that, oh, I'm going to do an MFA. I'm going to be a writer for two years, maybe a writer apprentice, but still a writer. And, and of course, there's a bigger question, like who gets to call oneself a writer? What do you do? I mean, you, it's a profession you put in your passport. Is it, do you call yourself a writer when you make a living from it? Do you call yourself a writer when you get acknowledged as a writer? It's a huge debate, but once you make this professionalize and make it an academic industry, you really create a possibility. And this obviously has pros and cons. This is huge positive and huge negative aspects. So that's a different debate. 
But you know what is what I think is very interesting is um, certainly in subcontinental India, and this would also include Bangladesh because this is um, sort of going back to colonial history. Um, English always has had a certain association of upward mobility. That oh, English is the language. If we learn, we can get far in life. We can do things. It's an aspirational language, right? Uh, as opposed to in Anglo-American world, where English obviously doesn't have that aspirational quality. Um, and um, and it is a language that is associated with upward mobility, right? And um, and that is also why English is actually a very popular subject. I'm talking of English literature, not creative writing. It's very popular, even at a time when English enrollments are declining all over the world. You know, English is still very popular in, in India and I'm assuming in Bangladesh too. Um, it did not happen with creative writing for a long time. It was unknown. And I think one reason is obviously language, you know, obviously in subcontinent, Indian subcontinent, English is a language for a very limited section of the population, even if it kind of pan subcontinent, but it's still a very limited, class limited. But um, slowly, I think what happens is, I mean, uh, obviously in the subcontinent, education is inseparable from mobility. And uh, so what you see is that in the 21st century, this aspirational quality in creative writing has finally become clear. And I think this probably became sort of most clear early on in the novels of Chetan Bhagat, you know, who I suppose some of you know, know, know his work is that the whole notion of this suburban boy coming to this big city or kind of writing in English, which is sort of inflected with Hindi or the kind of English, which I don't have to be really smart or educated to understand, even I can get it in the sense of empowerment. That is actually very interesting. And what I see today, I mean, I, 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 I had a department of creative writing uh, at Ashoka, I think probably the only university house creative writing department um, in India. And, um, but even outside of that, I think Ambedkar University also has a department, but even outside of this, there are so many community programs, you know, every literature festival in India, um, well, often when I'm speaking, they'll say, okay, do a creative writing session or publishers run this session. And it's, it's very popular in the community and it has this community driven aspirational quality. And that's where I think, you know, um, sort of slowly sort of coming to the last part of my talk and I can we can open an open this up to question is that the big question that I often get asked is that you know can it be taught or learned is it really possible is it really and I always say that um, the really important parts no because I think um, for me art is a kind of this endless dialectic between the familiar and the alien you need certain things that you identify in familiar but you also need to be shocked and language also needs to capture that. You, it, you need familiar words, but need to be used them in the unfamiliar way. But um, but the components of writing come to you very mystically. Like when I'm often asked, oh, what do you, what comes to you first? Is it the plot, the character? And for me, strangely, it's always the place. It's the setting. And there's there's no explaining that. Like in 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 one of my novels, The Firebird, which is a novel about. Um, set in the world of theater and a, and a small boy's relationship with his mother, who's an actress. For me, the setting of theater, the wings, the green room, and the city of Calcutta, where Bangla theater had this kind of milieu, had this kind of magnetic conflict between a certain Marxist tradition and a kind of older decadent tradition where prostitutes acted. This place was in, sort of in, inevitable for me. I had to capture the space. Or even in uh, my most recent novel, The Scent of God, which is set in a Hindu monastic boarding school, but it's about erotic, romantic love between two boys. The milieu is always more very important. And from milieu comes the question of voice, that what voice is what are you speaking about from that character? And, and that I'm with Wolf, that character is probably the most important thing in fiction. The point is, you can't you can't be taught these things. You can't be taught these things. Certainly, you cannot be taught in a classroom space. Your learning happens. It's like that question Richard Feynman was asked during the Manhattan Project. Oh, all your scientists log in. You know, they, um, sorry, everybody logs in here. Your scientists don't log in their hours. And Feynman is supposed to have said that, oh, you know, my scientists get some of their best ideas while sleeping. 
So how do I how do I log in those hours? So obviously with writers, the writing, that learning never stops. It's always it's always happening. And I do believe that the more technical arts, the more technical an art form is, the more teachable it is. And I think the most technical art form is film. Film has a lot of technical aspects, a lot of scientific, a lot of engineering aspects, which need to be taught. Um, music has technical aspects. I personally think, and people might might differ, that literature is the least technical of all art forms. Um, and I think prose is the least technical of all because you know poetry is still has some technical elements. Of course, we we speak in prose generally, at least as long as we are sober. You know, so there is that um, that is the form. And uh, but that doesn't mean that creative writing class doesn't have a lot of functions. Uh, I think the most important function is that the function of any institution, it creates a community. It creates a community. It creates, it sort of brings people together. And, um, and anybody who writes knows that writing is very isolated. It is very lonely. Of course, this was the solitude that was celebrated in the early arrival of modernity in the print culture. This is the solitude with Emmanuel Ego to his railing in South Africa is not solitary which is a claim we don't have to accept. But the point is, at the end of the day, it is a very solitary art form. And anybody who's written knows that you're writing alone. It's not like being in a theater group. It's not like being in a film group. It's not even like being part of a music band. You know, there's a, there's a communal element to, to that. But the great thing about creative writing class or a studio, studio is the better word for it than class, that it brings people together. It brings the community of lonely people together and it gives them some space to talk about. And um, I think a good teacher's job is to sort of make a story or a poem, um, become the best story of poem it can become, not turn it into something else. And the one thing I always say is that the best part of creative of creative writing studio is that it teaches you reading. It's not about the writing part, you'll write anyway. What if you are that raw genius, you have no idea that what you've written is any good. That can be taught, that it one can teach that how to read writing. And when you're reading somebody else's work, most of all, you're teaching yourself. I mean, writers like to have this uh, magnet on their fridge, you know, write drunk, edit sober. And I totally believe that. When you're writing, you're possessed. You're like a demon. You're like a possessed soul. After that, sobriety returns. You know, the disenchanted rational phase when you become the editor, then it's a different thing. Again, every writer is a different process. So that is a very important part of creative writing. And I'll, um, I think already as one of my former colleagues um, at Stanford, Andrea Lunsford says that we kind of ironically are moving from the age of um, you know, consumption to the age of production. It's almost people seem to be more intent on writing than reading. And that is the sort of the dynamic that we can restore because a creative writing, the idea of creative writing is also about creative reading. You know, creative reading is actually the more important part of creative writing. So when you create a community, when you create that institution, and it's, a, as I said, it's a long journey. It's been a long journey going back to the European Enlightenment, to the institution of creative writing classes today, that it does return that kind of renewed focus on reading. So I think I'll stop here today because I, I can already see there are a number of questions that have come up in the chat box. And I'll be happy to take your questions. Um, if anybody would like to maybe moderate the question uh, answer session, then I'm happy thank you. To... Thank you so much. Like, you know, so yes, starting from the um, you know pre-modern to the Enlightenment, then the Romantic and the Modernist, and then the postmodernist. So quite a journey. Like in, in one hour, you know, the canvas has been amazing. And as you can see, like you know, so you have generated a flurry of uh, questions. Um, Maybe I can read some or like, you know, you want to read your stuff? Uh, sure, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll go in order. Um, I'll go in order. Thank you for the welcome messages. Um, um, uh, well, somebody saying with due respect, see the truth that's told from the Greek. Um, uh, who's told? Do you want to speak up? Do you want to um, explain your question? Um, if you're there. Um, 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 well, stealing, yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I love calling Shakespeare a sophisticated plagiarist, you know, because clearly there were 
lot of that but you know you don't really have stealing at a time when you think of you can have stealing only when property becomes private you know when there's no private property there's no stealing you know? so clearly it's a very very interesting subject even what milton does with the bible is really quite fascinating clearly um milton is taking the story but uh, he's obviously subverting the morality of the bible and blake famously said that milton was of the devil's party without knowing it so there are very interesting kind of concerns um and then uh, mashur raman uh, do you want to um um say something about the question uh, celebrate poets and musicians play in a like fardosi and tansen of course and of course when you name these figures it's not only pre enlightenment it's outside of western culture and that's a sort of more complicated case i'm deliberately kept my lecture confined to west because um then it opens too many cans of worms there's so many other things you know there's it becomes very complicated um definitely there were performers and musicians um but as i said it's it was very much a performance the idea of sort of printed personal consumption you know uh, and I, there i always think the sort of the bangla word for literature sahitya is very interesting that obviously as you know it comes from the sanskrit word sahit plus shnya the pratyashnya that the companionship of the reader and the writer and i found it always interesting and somebody who knows sanskrit better can maybe tell me i i am not very much of an expert on that but this idea of the sahit sahit is the communication the companionship sahit means obviously th those of you who know bangla know that is karo shohit thaka that you're being with somebody and this mutual companionship one to one companionship i find it very interesting because this was certainly not the case with a musician who's performing for an audience of 100 or a playwright because there's no there's no there's no one to one companionship here this this solitary companionship is what i think is modern about literature and that makes me feel that maybe the word sahitya also indicates this modernity but i'm i'm not an expert on that so i don't want to venture mm. but um um i would love to hear some other voices really i'm talking for a long time so why don't you why don't you open up sit so sort to of speak your questions if you would <laughs> uh professor um ahmed am sorry dr dr shidib ghosh would you like to voice out your question shidib uh, are you there uh it's a great question about translation i think it's very interesting yeah shidib I can see you. You're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah, please unmute yourself. Hi, hi. I'm sorry. Hi, sir. Good. Uh, my question is, you know, uh, we find a lot of works in in vernacular. Uh, of, I'm focusing on Indian literature, mm -hmm. and uh, I have specified one Malayali text which is translated into English. And my question is, you know, how far has the translation been an important uh, medium to define the idea of the creative? and how does it go with the western notion of creativity you know that's a great question and i think i will um, leave this question to translators to answer because i have heard different translators define this as um, differently i once had a, a discussion about this with a translator from urdu rakshanda jalil and i know rakshanda rakshanda has very strongly believes that um, translation is not creative you know that i'm just not um, um, i'm just kind of but and then there are translators who believe and one of them would be my former professor p lal who as some of you know coined the term transcreation because transcre for him all translation was a kind of creation and um that um that you know even there's so many translated texts where the titles are different where the focus is different and um so i don't see how it's not and i think translation is obviously an important part of creativity even when you're writing in english i mean as you know as you read my work you know that when i'm capturing a very bengali milieu in english i'm doing a kind of a translation inside somewhere you know a certain translation of a local value system translation of a certain kind of syntax i mean speech is very clear example when you're writing 
Uh, Raja Rao said this long time back, the idea is to capture an English alive that is not lived in English. English. So the speech must have a certain cadence, a certain awkwardness even. You know, the awkwardness is the beauty. You know, awkward without hindering communication. It should not be awkward enough where it hinders communication, but it should be awkward enough to indicate there's an alien shadow behind it, right? And I actually, even when it comes to reading, I personally first experienced it when I read um, uh, Anantamurti Samskara. This was Ramanujan's translation. And I, I mean, I grew up reading a lot of Bangla, much of, but my formal training was in Western and English literature. And I think I was um, given a very post-enlightenment, very new critical sense of craft, very Joycean. And I myself wrote in that. And when I read Samskara, my first response was, oh my God, this is such bad writing. You know, the writing is... And then I started thinking, okay, I have a certain notion of good writing lodged inside me. And there are many kinds of, you know, disruptive good writing, a disruptive writing which disturbs this notion of good writing. And that's very important. I mean, um, another writer friend of mine, Amit Chaudhary says this a lot about D.H. Lawrence, you know, another English writer who definitely disrupts the right idea of good writing. If you put Lawrence and Joyce next to each other, Joyce is the quintessential master craftsman. Every sentence is perfectly crafted. Lawrence has plenty of really bad sentences, really bad sentences, but that is the greatness that they, this bad writing is a kind of a eruption of a strange, almost gothic sensibility. I mean, I and this is where I think over the years, I've also as a matured as a writer, I have moved away from this notion of the perfectly crafted sentence, the perfectly. Sometimes when I'm editing a novel, I've thrown out the best sentence. You know, it's not a team player. I think one needs one needs to be a really great writer to afford to write badly. And I think that kind of bad writing, anyway, I've deviated very far from the question of translation. The point is to say that when you translate, you are kind of bridging this cultural terrains. The bigger difficulty is not about the meaning of a word or a term, but to go from a certain value of good writing to a totally different world. How do you how do you preserve that? And I think a translator's job is in both ways to sort of make it sort of work in the target language, the language needs to be translated, but also retain the shadow of the alien language. And of course, this is much harder if the translation is happening between say, English and Bengali or English and Hindi or Hindi and French than between English and French, languages which are culturally already very close. But when you're translating between a Western and non-Western language, then I think it's, um, and I think it's creative, but of course I can also see, you know, people like um, Rakshan this point that, so I think the ultimate call is the translators, because I think just like race or, you know, religion, artists should have the right to self-identification. And if you identify as something, then nobody else can question you. Shamshad, do you want to? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I was just thinking of Kaisa sir, like, you know, who did the Monasha Mongol, like, you know, and the, uh, the triumph of the snake goddess. And right. so he, he's actually done transcreation. I don't know whether, you know, Professor Kaiser Hawk would like to join in. He's there incognito. But I, I, I was intrigued by your, um, the, you know, the bridge between the familiar and the unfamiliar, kind of the uncanny that you mentioned, like, as a, as a creative process. And wow. uh, the idea of, like, you know, like, you know, so, this kind of, you know, connectivity between like you know, the, the self within and the self outside and the essential romantic authorship that you mentioned, the, you know, reputation of the infinite I am that Coleridge has put in Biographical Literary. And that in a way is the, like, you know, the individual authorship, which goes against the communal composition that goes beforehand, right? So, but when it comes to like, and I, I think uh, Dr. Shudeep has the question about postmodern composition and uh, we, and uh, I also added to that, so the idea of interactive text, you know, so when you come to an interactive text, you know, hypertext, mm -hmm. uh, going back to a different form of communal writing. So what do you say about that? Right. No, I think it's very important, the idea of um, the familiar and the alien. I mean, I think whenever we read a novel, 
or watch a movie, um, we want to say, oh my God, I know that character. That character is, you know, that character is exactly like the gossipy aunt I have, or this is exactly how my mom fights with me. We want to say that, but we also want the exact opposite. We also want to be shocked. We don't want everything we know to be given to us, but we also don't want something that we can't relate to at all. So fine art is this delicate tension between the alien and the familiar. You know, and of course, some art is closer to the alien, like of course, writers of science fiction, or if you're writing a speculative world, you're closer to the alien. And of course, if you're writing a kind of a kitchen story of very everyday life story, then you're closer to the familiar. But all writers might have elements of the both. You know, even science fiction, we know that we are drawn to it, not because it's alien, but even aliens show very human motivation. And that is what draws us to it. In the same way, when we are, you know, even a writer like Jane Austen or Shashi Deshpande who are talking about very bourgeois women's lives, there are moments of drama. There are moments of shock, which sort of, and I think that, that Ochin Paki think, metaphor is actually perfect. Poetry does it beautifully too. That it's that, it's a sweet spot. It's a sweet spot which a writer must hit. You must hit the sweet spot between the alien and the familiar. Just the way another set of binaries I tell my students between the microscope and the telescope, you know, right? Uh, this is a really interesting difference between the oral tale and the modern short story. The oral tale, as if, if you read the oral tale, whether it's the Arabian Nights or Jatakas, you'll, one thing you'll see, they often cover a huge territory, thousands of years, not always, but often. It's almost like the writer has this kind of, or, Writer again is not the right term, the teller has a kind of a telescope, huge. The biggest difference, the modern short story is, it's very cinematic. It is like somebody supposed to, this might be a true or apocryphal story, sort of asked Anton Chekhov that, oh, how do you get your ideas? How do you write all these short stories? Then Chekhov is supposed to have said like, oh, put your cigarette on the ashtray and I'll write a story about it. In other words, I don't really need a subject. You know, I, anything can be. But notice very interestingly, he said, cigarette on the ashtray, meaning a scene, an immediate. So it's the microscopic. So this is again, what creative writing classes, a big thing you'll often hear is, oh, show don't tell. So, you know, show is like kind of this immediate sensory revelation as opposed to, and you know, as, as a novelist, I'm always dealing with both because there are times when I'm like describing, you know, like, I don't know, this coffee cup I'm holding, like absolute minute, there's a little bit of paper on it. I'm describing that. I'm, sort of entering into that space. But there are also times when I'm stepping back and saying, and then two years passed. So I'm kind of moving back to the telescope. So this constant alteration of the telescope and the microscope. And some writers are better to using the telescope and some writers are better using the microscope. But you must know both. In the same way, it's like alien and the familiar. Some writers are better with the alien, some writers are better with the familiar. I personally like the familiar more. I'm not a huge fan of science fiction. I'm not a huge fan of, I like, I like to be, I, I think the biggest surprises and shocks are there in everyday life. But again, that doesn't mean that I'm not exploring what is shocking in everyday life. So I think those are the dialectics that writers are balancing, whether or not they know it. Yeah, the optics uh, that remind me of, um, of course, uh, Gulliver's Travels, Jonathan Swift, mm -hmm. you know, Lilliputian and the Brobding Nag. So he is using both sides of the binocular. Right. Yes, yes, You're exactly. using the microscope and the telescope, but for him, it was the binocular, like, you know, so he was, you know, changing the lenses. So, yeah, an interesting thought. So, maybe yes. it's like, yeah, that's, yeah, and, and the show and tell, like, you know, this is another area, like, you know, so this is a huge debate, like, you know, whether you should just tell or, like, you know, it has to be a show and tell. You know, maybe our students can join in. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, I think, um, Telling gets a bad rap. I think good telling is actually pretty hard. And um, I think in the um, modern short stories, the writers who do this kind of telling are mostly the Latin American writers, some Chinese writers. I mean, Julio and um, uh, Isabella Lende's stories are, you know, sometimes they, the magic realism takes across. I mean, for the most part, the modern short story is a kind of a secular um, I mean, you see what you see, you see a slice of life. The slice of life short story is dominates 
the modern mm -hmm. consciousness. It's like a close shot. But once in a while, you'll get a story which takes you through 3,000 years within a story. But that, the, the, the ancestor of the story is actually the oral tale. You know, it's right. not exactly the modern, it's not very modern in spirit. Yeah. It's a very so interesting. For example, Tony Morrison, like in the bluest eye, initially says that, you know, why cannot be answered? So we need to focus on the how, right? So this idea that like, you know, you're going to tell a story, again, the shock is there but the shock cannot be explained. So you, you just like focus on the process of the shock rather than telling about that, you know, shock, why a father has raped a daughter in the bluest eye, right? So, exactly. yeah. Exactly. That's right, thank you. Uh, any question? We don't want to monopolize the conversation. May I ask a question, sir? Uh, yes. yes, please. Uh, Bikash. This is uh, Bikash Bhomik uh, from Media Studies and Journalism Department. Uh, you have, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Shoikot. Uh, you have answered uh, though some of part of my question when you have uh, uh, answered the question of uh, Mr. Shudip Ghosh. Uh, you said that uh, craft is not sometimes, uh, are not crafts are not important uh, uh, for writers. Uh, sometimes uh, be, uh, good crafted, best crafted uh, writing, uh, uh, the writers remove, okay. Uh, but when you talk about when you uh, go to the screenplay writing, uh, this is also creative writing. Uh, can we think uh, a screenplay without uh, knowing the craft of writing of a screenplay? Uh. Right. No, I mean craft is a very complex question. You know, like um, I think that's why it's fascinating that um, um, I mean you don't have to consciously think of craft. I mean some of us. Are writers who thought about this consciously, we are writers as well as critics, so we can speak in a certain language. But again, there's a certain expression quite popular in American creative writing class cycles called the idiot savant. You know, you, you know this expression, I'm sure. The idiot savant is somebody who does something beautifully but can't explain why they did it. You know, that's kind of the another image of the writer, which is quite popular. The writer is an idiot savant. Um, and um, I think it's very interesting. I think about this a lot that in some ways, I mean, I'm a prose writer, I write novels and I write prose essays. And I think there's craft in it too, but I always think poetry is the more crafted because poetry is obviously a departure from everyday speech or at least everyday speech of bourgeois people. I mean, there are other people who, whose speech might be more naturally poetic, but, um, and um, as I said, the more, the more technical an art form, and, I, and that's why I mentioned filmmaking as a very technical art form, because filmmaking is, um, first of all, a collective art form, right? It's not something you do alone. And I think, and I don't really know much about screenplay writing at all. I've never done it myself. Um, but I imagine when you're writing a screenplay, you are not just um, sort of doing something by yourself. It's like, a musical score, you know, one can, people who read musical scores, um, they get great pleasure out of reading it, but it's really a kind of a potential art form. It is fully realized when it's actually performed, which is what Shakespeare's plays were to Shakespeare. So the written form, whether the folio or the quarto, or he couldn't be bothered less. It's it's simply a means. It's the same reason why, you know, I've written a bit about um, Bengali theater and uh, you know one of my novels is set in the world of Bengali theater and I when I was doing some research I found that some of the classic most popular plays don't even exist as a book because nobody cared about their presence as books it's like it just they just knew it and honestly Shakespeare would have been one of them I'm not even interested in their status much later so again screenplays I mean I know now sometimes screenplays are published you know they're that's a rare thing, but screenplay is also a potential art form, and and I guess when somebody is writing a screenplay, there are a lot of potential land. So that's very important. Any other questions? I'm glad that you mentioned the idea of research for for your play on the um, theater, Bangla theater. So, what exactly is the role of research? You know, especially like you know when you have. Uh, you know, an anthropological story or, a, or an archaeological story. So the archaeology of the text. Now, how, how do you capture that? Like, you know, because there are some uh, students here, uh, I, I think it would be helpful for them to know. So the role of, you know, research for creative writing. 
Right. I think this is again on which uh, you know every writer has a different take. I mean, in fact, writing is such a personal business that one can only tell what works for one. Um, I personally, I'm I'm not a huge fan of research-based fiction. I, with some exceptions, I don't enjoy reading them greatly, and I don't write them because. I rather what I've done is often I've written um, novels which evoke a world I knew in the past. Like obviously this theater is something I see, saw my, my mother was a theater actress and some of it comes from my personal memory, but it also involved doing some research in playhouses and where the ruined theater houses are right now. And I realized I ended up researching my own memory in a way researching or other people's memory. When you talk to other people, so that live, liveliness of the research and there are so many different kinds. I mean, I was once um, on a panel at, at the Jaipur Literature Festival with uh, Vikram Chandra. Whom I don't know if you read his book, Sacred Games, uh, which was also thrown into a Netflix series. And we would ask the question that do you research? And I gave this answer and Vikram's answer was, Vikram actually um, was doing a lot of research for Sacred Games, but the research basically involved going to Bombay and talking to mafia dons. <laughs> it's the kind of research which is right. kind of my life. You know? <laughs> so that, that's a different kind of research than say somebody goes to a museum or an art gallery or meets a kind of ancient manuscript. I mean, I think, I think research is, I define research as something for which you have to step out of your everyday life. Now, Shamshad, if you were to write a campus novel, and it's full of details about academic life. I would not consider that research because you inhabit that now that world as part of your everyday life. Now, if you were to write a novel about the stock exchange, which is full of details about it, I'm assuming you don't have a you don't have another life as a stock broker. <laughs> One can never assume. But I, if you I wish, life, <laughs> yeah, then <laughs> that would be research because for that you you're stepping out of your regular life to do something else. And um, I think it can be done. Um, clearly, I think the best example of the research novel in our times is Amitabh Ghosh, who has really used his uh, skills as an anthropologist to sort of, uh, sort of write fiction. Um, I personally um, haven't done a lot of research. I mean, I've, I mean, I did research, for instance, even while writing the five word and found that I could use none of it. It sort of gives you a certain kind of security, emotional security, but that's it. I ended up writing other essays from that research, but it didn't really make its way in the novel. But as I said, every writer is different. Yeah, so one related question would be, you know, because we're dealing with the binary between fact and fiction mm -hmm. and Marjorie Parloff, like, you know, so she was saying like, you know, one of the reasons why English studies is failing because nobody mm -hmm. takes it seriously. Like, you know, we try to be like, you know, so we, we, under the rubric of cultural studies, we try to be sociologists, we try to be archaeologists, anthropologists, you know, whatnot, like competitive religion and whatnot. So nobody takes it seriously, like, you know, especially people in the social science and other disciplines, you know? So like, you know, when you bring in, so the aspect of research, academic research, because you have a certain character, maybe who is an astronaut and you have no idea, like, you know, how an astronaut should be in real life. So you have your research and then uh, you do a shoddy job, job of it like you know so you know because that you, you you're trying to make believe a world but then again it's not there uh, so th th this is where like you know the originality aspect comes in that how can you be original you know without compromising like you know your realm of familiarity so going back to your you know so mm -hmm. I familiar and unfamiliar once again I suppose. Mm -hmm. You see, the biggest part of research, what you're talking about is not the factual part. The factual part is not hard to get, especially in today's world of Google search. And But what is hardest is, what does it feel to be somebody else? What does it feel like to be somebody else? You know, what Precisely. does it yeah. feel? Uh, inhabiting the life of somebody else. And this can happen at a very basic level. I mean, you know, as novelists, we are, you know, I've just finished writing a novel with primarily female characters, you know, what does it, and the protagonist is a woman. So obviously the first question is, of course, the most obvious one which concerns all of us is, what does it mean to be another gender from yourself? Or what does it mean to be another sexuality? You know, if you are 
if you're straight, but you are writing about a queer experience or if you're queer writing. One of the biggest challenges I think which people from the subcontinent face is class, right? Because in many ways, and I've been very, this is something that has sort of tantalized me for a long time because um, domestic stuff is all around us. You know, the intimacy with which, you know, our lives entwine, you know, especially things like child rearing or caring for elderly people. And yet the gulf, yet the sheer gulf, how easy or how difficult is it for a novelist? And remember the novel itself is a bourgeois art form because the novel is, you know, in some ways, I mean, if you've seen the, the movie Gully Boy, you know, that Gully Boy and that kind of rap music is the natural form. Whereas the novel is already kind of disadvantaged because we are such a literate, self-conscious, cerebral art form. But is it possible to create a novelistic consciousness that inhabits a radically different class? You know, this is obviously the problem with the historians that the subaltern studies historian said that, oh, how does one write history from the perspective of the Santal? And historians said, we just can't. There's a point we just can't because there's a certain rationality historian. Now, a novelist can, it's possible because we don't have any such obligations to reason. But the fact that you can doesn't mean it's easy at all. It's actually extremely difficult. So mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that it's not just about the factual knowledge. I think the hardest part of writing novels, and it can be also about poems in, in a sort of shorter bits, is to imagine otherness. Right. right? Otherness is very important. I mean, writing is, again, this dialectic between the self and the other. You, I think the way art distinguishes itself from the social sciences is that it's always about the particular, about some particular vision, particular experience, particular person, particular moment. Um, but the particular doesn't have to be just me. You know, I must, I know what it's like to be me, but I must also know what it's like to be somebody else because I can't populate a novel just with myself. And that I think is the challenge. No, excellent observation. So, Muttaki, you have raised your hand. Please go ahead. Thanks. Um, yes, sir. So, I had a question for Professor Ojundar, yes. uh, which was that a lot of us, when we are like writing or aspiring to write, we have to like contend with the idea that we're trying to portray and how that's going to be portrayed by the reader. Mm -hmm. So, so what is your stance on that? Uh, process like when you're mm -hmm. trying to write should you keep the audience in mind or should you just come kind of try to do the best in trying to stay say your story and what would happen if like let's say the story that you're trying to say uh is like you know interpreted in a different manner right right no very good question yeah. um i think every writer will give you a different answer i think when you're especially when you're writing novels the most important thing is not the story i think the most important thing is actually character that is the first thing um and again in this matter aristotle was right the story is simply whatever the character does so that follows from the character not the other way around i've seen writers who sort of created a plot and then tried to populate it with characters it doesn't work it's always the other way around is the character must real and virginia Woolf says that very well in mr in her essays um, I think for me, what I find most important is, and this is also something, you know, the American creative writing schools talk a lot about, the question of voice. I think the tone, I mean, once you know what is going to be the voice through which this, this story is going to be narrated, the energy, is it an angry voice? Is it a sad voice? Is it a sarcastic voice? Or is it a mixture of all these different things? that is a kind of a life force which decides which sort of sort of gets the story going because the voice is rooted in character and again you know one can be a writer like james joyce and james joyce believed in that you know there's no such thing as a style um style must always belong to the particular character who is narrating. Like his famous expression was the image of the God, image of God bearing his fingernail. So if you read Ulysses, you'll see that the chapters which are sort of close to Bloom's mind, the language is completely different. The syntax is completely different. It's choppy, it's more slangy, 
it's more humorous, it's kind of obscene. Um, and from the chapters written close to Stephen Dedalus's perspective are totally different. They're high flowing, they're much more intellectual, they're much more artistic, they're much more ambitious, much more formal, much more Latin. So clearly Joyce, and then again, of course, there's a famous Molly Bloom's reverie at the end where it's basically a single 48 page sentence, one sentence extending 48 pages. So clearly, you know, Joyce is a kind of writer who believed in giving the voice completely to the characters. And, but again, someone like Lawrence is very different. He kind of has the same kind of voice. Wolf is very, so I think for me also, I've found a story or a novel. I mean, I haven't written short stories for a while now. I write novels really takes off when I get the voice right. And the voice says something about the worldview. What is the ethos of this world? And then again, does it have a particular connection to a character? Like, is it a first person story? Like probably the most famous example of that would be Nabokov's Lolita where Humbert Humbert's voice completely kind of overpowers, right? That sort of um, overpowering voice uh, but it can also be a third person voice like Tolstoy's novels, like, you know, where um, it is an omniscient third person, but it's like a drone, you know, the drone sort of moves close to somebody in the room here. And then again, it moves away, moves far from everybody. And again, comes close to somebody else. It's kind of roving eye. It can sort of touch anybody. So I think perspective and voice and through that character are actually the most important thing. I really don't, think you can't be thinking too much about audience. I mean, you you probably think of the audience at a later stage. And of course, you know, obviously writing a book has many practical phases and depending on who's your publisher, whether you're writing commercially, there are all kinds of other things coming. But at the raw, primitive, early stage of writing, I don't think you think of any of that. Hi, Thank you, sir. Yes. Hello, oh, Zakir. Good I'm to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, you? So uh, you were once in the United States, you know, and uh, we know both that uh, many universities introduced uh, uh, what you can say MFA program or BFA program in creative right. writing, fiction, poetry, and all these things, you know. Right. So, and uh, some of the programs are uh, producing uh, what you can say uh, students, former students who are even uh, begging some prizes. For example, say uh, Jumpa Lahiri, she won uh, what you can say Pulitzer Prize later, but she completed her MFA from uh, Boston University, uh, as far as I know. Uh, so I think I am not good enough to um, uh, come up with a question, you know, rather I would like to mention something from Doris Lessing. And I want to see, though it is highly idiocentric, um, um, idiocentric uh, 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 personally, you can say, uh, I, I think that I should mention it. Uh, I, I would like to see how you address it. I once, her words, these are quote, I once visited a writer's group run by a university in the States, and it was a most punishing experience. It was filled with extremely bright people. They had all read everything. One of their number would bring material with them to the group where it would be criticized viciously by the others. I would never have survived a creative writing course. They savaged each other and what they were critiquing was critics, not writers. I am prepared to bet on that. <laughs> well, you know, it's not surprising that creative writing uh, at the university gets a lot of flack because it, as I said, it's literally industrializing and professionalizing an artistic pursuit, which um, is essentially anti-professional. Um, and I'm all with that. I fully agree that, uh, and I think the US, uh, I, I did an MFA myself, you know, I, um, you know, I was in Stanford for many years where the Stegner program is one of the most famous programs for creative writers. And um, um, there are a lot of problems, you know, I think a creative writing program can create a writer who's perfect with craft, but is completely soulless, beautifully crafted, perfect. And I see this a lot because you, this, and there's a kind of an excessive professionalization 
where people get preoccupied with the idea of agents and publishers and awards and the real business of writing just sort of falls away. So that can definitely happen. Uh, the flip side is that a very simple way of thinking of any institution is just by imagining it as a community. You know, it's just you're right. You're writing alone. Now you're with in a studio with a number of people who want to do the same thing. And I think any writer, I think you know, there are any writers in this room. You must value the importance of community. I mean, I, I, for me, I'm, I write. The moment I have a draft which I'm halfway happy or somewhat happy, I have to share it with some friends whom, whose judgment I trust, and they do the same thing with them. I read. I love. I love that exchange. So at some level, you can think of it as a community. And um, I mean, it's a bit like studying literature, actually. I think when you study literature mm -hmm. initially, you become so technical about everything that almost the pleasure seems to go away. But then that phase too will go away. You will outgrow that phase as well. You will go beyond that phase. And then again, you'll get back what I call, it's like what Blake said, innocence, enlighten, enlightenment, and then enlightened innocence. I call it amateur, professional, enlightened and amateur. You know, we must become enlightened amateurs again. So in a way, I think one can, that's a necessary phase when you first study theory, when you study craft, you're like completely take everything apart and you become totally unbearable in your, in your you just can't bore everybody with your tech talk. But that's a phase you must go through. And then you will come out of that phase too. You will once again return to a very primal pleasure of writing. But of course, something would have already changed. So I think these are just tools, you know, they have been destructive in many hands and I completely agree. And, um, you know, like Americans professionalize everything and a lot of problems come out of that. But at the same time, they've created a certain economy, a certain community. And if we can make something out of it, then it's good for us, right? And also the Bloomsbury group that you mentioned earlier, like, you know, so without the collaboration, you wouldn't have the modernism, like, you know, the way we have it. And say, for example, without Ezra Pound, you know, you wouldn't have T.S. Eliot. So that, so yes, the savaging was there, you know, so even though, like, you know, outside the BFA and MFA programs. So, exactly. So, I mean, uh, that is the largely the value. Yeah. What, what is the value of an MFA? It has no value. It's not an MBA. You know, it's not, I mean, mm. that's why they don't ever pay to get an MFA. You must get a scholarship to study because it's simply mm -hmm. a time to be together with a community of writers. And when you can call yourself, I'm seriously pursuing writing. After that, you know, who knows when you'll get to do that again. So it's the real values in the community, the time, the exchange, the institutional things are just props. They're just there to set it up. They have no value of their own, right? I think uh, Tanya has a question. Tasnia has a question, right, right. Oh, Tasnia, sorry. Tasnia? Yeah, I have a question. My name is Tasnia, uh, studying English literature in Leading University. I just want to ask, uh, what is the difference between traditional literature and modern literature, compare and contrast? And what is the importance of myths and legends today? As we know, literature includes lots of mythical stories and how do they impact readers today? Right, now, that's a great question. And I think that's a very big question to answer, but if, if I'm to give you like a one word answer, I think the biggest difference between non-modern literature and modern literature is that non-modern literature, the older literature, the literature of the epics, is about big things, is about love, war, empires. And modernity is the time when Chekhov can say that put your cigarette on the ashtray and I'll write a short story about it. Suddenly the banal, the everyday is the subject of literature. That I think, I'm, I mean, I actually wrote a book on this subject called Prose of the World, Modernism and the Banality of Empire, that how the ordinary the ordinary man, the ordinary feeling, how the marginal thing, Virginia Woolf staring at the mark on the wall and sort of a whole story comes out of it. You know, two people just wandering around the streets of a city, visiting pubs becomes a whole novel. That would be hard in the pre-modern age. It's not like the pre-modern age did not have moments of banality, even Shakespeare's plays have that. But if you think of even Shakespeare's plays, they're about big subjects, they're about, they're about aristocrats, they're about kings. So suddenly that 
sort of high class thing, the kind of extraordinary. There's a kind of focus on the extraordinary. And it's not that the extraordinary vanishes in the modern age, it's still there. But what we think of as the strain of high art in the modern age is suddenly around ordinary, ordinary people, ordinary emotions. You know, there's a certain democratization, which I think reflects the democratization of society. That, oh, suddenly ordinary people are voting, they're making a democracy possible. Literature and the arts must also reflect that. So that I think is one big feature. I think the extraordinary thrives, but the extraordinary starts to dominate the traditions of popular culture. Popular culture, which is why, you know, Greek myths passed into Hollywood film, you know, that's always there. But what we think of as literary, I think centers around this culture of the ordinary. That I think is a big marker. There are many other markers, which I, I, I think I touched on a few of them, the question of performance versus the question of writing, the question of um, sort of even the conception of time, the oral story and the kind of modern story. There are many differences, but for me, the question of the ordinary is a very fundamental one. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, no Thank you. Uh, maybe like you know, I'll just have like you know, one quick question and going back to Muttaki's question about the ideal reader, like you know, who is your ideal reader? And being a you know, say bilingual author, so if you're writing you know, a same story for a Bengali audience and an English speaking audience, like you know, how different that story would be? Like, you know, so uh, does it actually affect your writing? Like you know, when you have a publisher in mind, when you have a audience in mind, and set language or a class or a caste in mind? Hmm. Well, actually, I, I, it's kind of sad, but I'm not a bilingual writer. I do write, I mean, I read in Bangla, but I write only in English. I, I used to be a bilingual writer till school. And it's interesting that the last thing I wrote in Bangla was actually a play. Uh, but then I decided to write in English for a number of reasons. I, I mean, uh, it's often said that Shukat Majumdar writes Bangla novels, but he writes them in English. <laughs> they are often okay. Bengali, okay. Bengali in sensibility, very Bengali in milieu. Um, but I think for me, that is also, I mean, my, I think in some ways I take a lot from my life in Bengal, especially Calcutta. But my training has been very Western. My training has been especially American, which is why I was telling in response to Shudik's question earlier that my aesthetic sensibility is actually very post enlightenment, new critical, which is why even when I read you know, um, um, Anantamurthy's novel, I felt it was bad writing. So I, and this is something interesting when uh, my novel, um, um, The Firebird came out, there was a cover story in the um, Bengali um, newspaper, Ananda Bajar Putrika, uh, Rovi Vashudya, they have a section called Rovi Vashudya, which I'm sure some of you might know. And they did a cover story um, on my work on the theater. And there was a little box in which um, um, a translation from that novel was published, uh, just the opening scene. And uh, the translation was actually done by a very well-known poet and singer in Kolkata. Um, but I was not happy by the translation because, uh, and I, then I realized why. And, um, and then I realized why, because even though the subject seems very Bengali, my syntax is actually very English. And English syntax is, you know, obviously this is where the training of the translator comes into play. It's a kind of a difficult thing. So I can't say, you know, and, and uh, I mean, some of my novels are sort of being translated into Bangla and I'm kind of looking at it. And I think it's a, um, it's a, it's a very tricky thing. I mean, I don't think, um, obviously sometimes I feel that a big part of my audience is the Bangla reading audience who don't read English. So I'm kind of losing a big part of the audience, but what can you say? You come in the world with a certain sensibility and a certain training. And for many of us post-colonial writers, this division, we are split. We are split between worlds. And that is both our strength, but also our sadness. And we have to live with that. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Mikhail Mahfouz, do you have a question? Oh. 
I'm sure you're pretty tired of listening to my voice by now, so you probably want to break. Yeah, you must be tired, like you know, you have been, you know, the one who's speaking. <laughs> uh, sir, I had a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Professor Mozumda, thank you so much for the for the talk. It was very intoxicating. My name is Mafu. So I'm a lecturer here at ULAP. My question is that when you're writing a story, how much of it do you control? Because I have heard um, a lot of things about you know letting the story go and taking its own courses and shapes. But then again, sometimes the story doesn't really want to move. It's like the ineluctable modality of the visible and the audible. Right. So, um, how do you, how much do you control and how much do you let go? That's a great question. Thank you, Mosul. And and I'm, and I'm especially thankful that you use the word intoxicating. That's probably the best adjective I've heard described to one of my <laughs> talks. So, thank you for that. Um, it's a great question. You know, I believe that. I mean, every time I've tried to select the subject for a novel, I have failed, and I've thrown away two novels like that. Every time I feel a theme or a story possess me like a ghost and literally kind of held me by the scruff of my neck and demanded to be told, it worked. So Firebird was once a story, you know, the child and the mother and on stage and this whole idea that, oh, is my mother really dying on stage or is it a make-believe make dying? Is she kissing a stranger? What does it mean? I mean, so these questions just possessed me like a demon and I had to write it and um, I believe there is an element of compulsion at least at the early stage that you must feel compelled to write it now that being said once you feel compelled there are a lot of technicalities there are a lot of technicalities which need conscious effort and um I mean, personally, for me, I don't have a lot of writer's block. I don't generally face a point where I can't write, but I have a lot of false writing. That is, I write a lot and then I realize it's all trash and throw it away. That happens to me. And there are writers who just can't write. So it's again, it's extremely personal. Writing is as personal as living. You know, you are like, you're like a human being, just the way you have different strengths and flaws as a human being, you have different strengths and flaws as a writer. It's very... It's very impossible to make general statements. Um, but I do think that you must feel a certain mystical kind of force. Now, again, you know, anybody who's read theory knows that mystical forces can also be ideologically cultivated. I mean, just the way Marxists talk about religion, that, oh, it's a people feel they're under a compulsion, but they, that's a debate I'm not going to enter right now. But I think for a good for any work any poem or prose work to be real for me the most important quality is honesty it must be honest and i don't care if it's difficult or easy i don't think these are any simple some people say oh do you prefer a difficult language or do you prefer a simple language this is no such thing you know sometimes a simple language is the honest thing sometimes a difficult language is the honest thing it all depends on what the spirit of the work calls for the spirit of the work sometimes calls for a very simple language. I mean, my last two novels were the protagonists were very young. They were children or teenagers. So the language is very simple. But one might write a very different kind of a work where the call, you know, I was actually talking about Mashur's novels, you know, both Althusser and August Abchaya. I mean, I think they, I mean, it's very interesting how there are a lot of experimentations in those books. And yet there's a kind of a grounded simplicity. So I think there's no rule. There's no rule of the thumb. You will know. Of course, it has a lot to do with who you are, what your personality is, who you are becoming with that story, and you may change. But um, I think one must be honest. One should not write, one should not introduce complexity to impress one should not introduce simplicity to win readers. That never works. You must honestly, as honest as you can, create the style and the ethos that your work demands organically. And to understand the de organic demand is the success of a writer. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's interesting that uh, 
you echoed William Wordsworth in saying that, you know, poet is an honest man and you need to be honest to your senses, you know, the, the way you like, you know, describe your surrounding, but, you know, you put it in, in a modernist context and going back to Ulysses, the way, you know, you talked about Stephen Diddler's Molly and, mm -hmm. you know, the syntax, you know, so it differs, like, you know, the vulgarity comes in, then you have the sanitization and the aesthetics coming in. And then you, of course, have the, you know, fragmented uh, sentences. And so it's not difficult for the sake of being difficult. You know? yeah. So if the, the, if the story demands, if the plot demands, you know. Or being simple for the sake of being simple. Neither. Absolutely. Neither. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I think that, that that's a great tip for our budding writers. Uh, that, you know, so don't write to impress, you know, so if it is come from within, like, you know, so you should be honest to your senses, uh, if the situation demands. So yeah, so just give expression to your thoughts, you know, um, unless we have any other questions. So, you know, maybe we can wrap it up, you know, so it's, uh, maybe you have any parting thought, like, you know, so shake up before I I really enjoyed this. Um, I, I mean, I love the questions. I love um, the level of engagement. And uh, thank you for having me. I just wish there'll be a time when we are not just boxes on the screen and that I'll get to see you all in person. Hopefully once we get our lives back, when the, once the pandemic subsides, I'll be able to visit Dhaka and love to have a long order with all of you. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, you know, so uh, just make sure that, you know, that the moment the, COVID lockdown is gone, like, you know, we're going to send you an invitation. So be sure of it. You know, so yeah, maybe I'll uh, turn over to Rubayat for the formal closing, but just a quick uh, vote of thanks. Uh, so thanks to all the people who worked hard, like, you know, Samuntasir, uh, Naza, like, you know, the IT team uh, and uh, whoever was in charge. So thank you so much for making it happen on such short notice. And of course, thanks to, you know, Dr. Sherkat Majumdar for agreeing to be part of this virtual uh, discussion. Uh, this was intoxicating as my junior colleague, you know, Martha just put it, you know, so, uh, and especially like, you know, I, I don't think we had a formal talk on creative writing uh, in the department. So uh, I wonder why, like, you know, we, we, you know, talk about like, you know, different genres, but uh, creative writing, you know, as, as a topic. So somehow we never picked it up. Uh, so this was, kind of an eye-opener for us. So thank you for, you know, so uh, stating the obvious and like, you know, uh, covering the huge canvas. So that was an amazing fit. So going back to the oral tradition and coming back, coming to the enlightenment and the romantics and then the modernist and the postmodernist, and you did it, you know, so within the span of one hour. So yeah, it's kind of a 60 minutes uh, from NBC, like, you know, so you know, we have the whole conversation going on. So thank you so much. So maybe I'll just hand over to Rubai. And of course, I'll be in touch and uh, we should uh, keep the conversation going. So uh, my heartfelt gratitude uh, for your presence today and all our audience, my colleagues and students and the guests. So thank you so much for, uh, you know, so spending your Saturday afternoon with us. Right. And thank you for reaching out with the invitation. I'm very honored. <laughs> no, we are honored. So thank you so much. The pleasure is all ours. Thank you, sir, and thank you, Dr. Mojumdar, for such an insightful, engaging talk. And I personally loved when you said writing is as personal as living. Uh, I'm still trying to convince myself that I can write. Uh, I'll quote you when my mind rants that my writing is pointless. So thank you for that. Uh, with that, uh, dear all, uh, this brings an end to our today's seminar. Uh, thank you so much for your presence, and we look forward to seeing you all again in our future events. Stay safe and take care. Thank you. Bye. All right.